Wilma Neeson had a hard life. She was born in 1954 in San Francisco to Charles and June Neeson. When Wilma was only eight years old, her mother abandoned her and her sister Mona. Mona had a disability that rendered her unable to hear or speak. While in their father's custody, the two girls were neglected. They did not attend school and were locked in a bedroom closet while their father was at work. At age 10, Wilma could not read, write, or even eat with a fork. Eventually, Charles lost his job and the neglect got even worse. The family moved into their car. While Charles searched the streets for food, Mona was confined to the car's trunk. The abuse continued until 1964, when California authorities removed both Wilma and her sister from their father's care. Wilma found herself traveling from foster home to foster home in search of a loving family. She eventually lived with her final foster home for several years at one time. As a young adult, she was given the nickname Boots, as she tended to hitchhike from place to place. She resorted to prostitution as a means of survival. Wilma married Donald Eugene Wellington in California on August 5, 1973, and they lived in the Hollywood area. She gave birth to Donald Wellington Jr. on December 12, 1974. Donald Wellington had an extensive record that included drugs, burglary, and other convictions along with pandering. Authorities believe that there is no doubt that he was pimping Wilma out. Investigators believe that Wilma was living with Don Wellington until October of 1975, after that time, it appears she was living in Long Beach with Robert Irwin. Wilma and Robert married on June 21, 1977, and they were living and working in a shop located at the intersection of Bellflower and Artesia in Bellflower, California. In the summer of 1977, Wilma gave birth to a daughter she named Crystal Joy. By February of 1978, it appears that Wilma left alone for California and was living in Georgia for a little while. She eventually traveled to Atlanta with a 54-year-old man named Charles Belt. Belt is the last known person to have seen Wilma alive. He would later tell detectives that he left Wilma at his mother's apartment for just a few days after arriving in Atlanta. There is no indication now of why she left Georgia. On October 4, 1978, Wilma's body was found with no identification laying in a ditch in Lyon County, Iowa. On the morning of October 4, 1978, a telephone company employee stumbled upon Wilma's body. It appears that Wilma's body had been dumped sometime between July and August of that year and was so severely decomposed that her face was unrecognizable. Her lower jaw was missing and only two teeth remained. A crime scene search team scoured the road and the surrounding area for her clothing and belongings. Unfortunately, the police found nothing of an evidentiary nature. All that remained was her clothing and a rope that was used to pull her from the car to where she was found. Her right elbow was dislocated, likely during a struggle leading to her death. The upper part of her body was unclothed and her pants and underwear were found wrapped around her left leg. When discussing Wilma's lifestyle, the police have been very clear that a crime is a crime regardless of who the victim is, regardless of who the bad guy is. The police said they all deserve your best effort. In addition, it's inescapable that the beginning of Wilma's life set into motion a trajectory toward her murder, and she deserved a better chance at that in life. For years, the Lyon County Sheriff tried hard to identify Wilma, known only as Jane Doe, who was brutally murdered in 1978. Her little girl grew up without knowing what happened to her biological mother. That is, until January 31, 2006, when a Des Moines laboratory technician found a match between her left thumbprint and a print card from the Los Angeles Police Department. It's also a clear reminder that there are good police officers who never give up trying to identify these Jane and John Doe's found throughout the United States. In 2006, the answer of who she was was made, but not the answer of why. Police have not given up, however. Lyon County Sheriff Blythe Blumenthal gave multiple interviews over the years about the case, hoping to shake up clues. When still in office, he admitted there wasn't a day that went by that he didn't think about this specific case. A paper timeline of her life stretched across his wall until he retired in 2012. After Wilma was identified in January of 2006, the sheriff submitted information about her murder to VICAP, which collects, collates, and analyzes violent crimes for similarities. VICAP has identified eight possible suspects. Investigators have since released a photo of one of the women they believe is responsible for Wilma's death. 
Of this photo, they said that their suspect was an escort, a prostitute, a dancer who liked to rob other escorts, prostitutes, and dancers. This suspect worked for the Sioux City Escort Service, known as Playmates or Playgirls. It is believed that Nissan may have also worked for them, too. They know where this suspect lives, and they have spoken to her, but she will not say anything about the case, and he needs someone else to link the two women. Due to the manner of death, there are believed to be at least two people that were involved in the murder. They don't know who the other person may be, but would like to talk to another person who went by the name Peaches. Peaches is also a black female, but she is not the one pictured, and she is not the suspect. They are two separate people. In addition to her married names of Wilma Wellington, Wilma Irvin, Wilma would sometimes use aliases such as Amy Irvin, Amy Belt, Wilma Belt, or Amy Neeson. Like so many unsolved crimes, it leaves behind pain even after some questions are answered. Wilma's daughter Chrissy has made it her mission to find out what happened to her mother. As the fingerprint taken from the Los Angeles Police Department finally gave Jane Doe back her real name, in some ways it offered new questions. On February 16th, the sheriff's office released her identity to the public. The story ran in media across the United States. On February 17th, Starla Patterson was sitting in her home in Seal Beach, California and spotted the article under a headline located in Long Beach Press Telegram. It turns out that for 10 years, Starla Patterson had been helping Wilma's daughter, Chrissy, try to find her biological mother. Chrissy promptly provided authorities with photos and what little information she knew about her mother. For Chrissy, it was the end of a journey that had been filled with hope and plagued by doubt. Chrissy was born premature in 1977 and raised by Alice and Vince House, who were also Wilma's foster parents. She grew up in Seal Beach and went to a Catholic church and a Catholic school. She was a rebellious and sometimes troubled teen, eventually becoming a ward of the court. Some of her life has paralleled that of her biological mother. In the past, she worked in Las Vegas as a dancer, and she also worked as an assistant in a drug rehab program in Washington State. Chrissy's friend Starla said that you look at her and she looks like this strong person, that she could do whatever she needed to, but that deep inside she's very vulnerable. Chrissy knew very little of her mother growing up. Her foster family tried to shield her from the truth. Chrissy would later go on to say that she wishes she had met her, that she would have known her. She always felt that their mother had moved on with a life without her, never suspecting that in actuality, Wilma had died about a year after her daughter was born. It haunts Chrissy not to know if her mother would have contacted her had she lived. Chrissy's friend Starla did what she could to help Chrissy find her parents. She started with her father. He was easy to find, she said. It took a phone book and a call. Chrissy was about 17 then. She would later go on to meet him in California. The quest for Wilma, on the other hand, was not so easy. Then on one surprising morning, she happened upon the article that was printed in the Long Beach Press Telegram. It was about 9.30 a.m. and Starla put on her tennis shoes and headed directly over to Chrissy's house with the news she discovered. Their quest had ended, however many questions had just begun. The sheriff has stated that he believes on Wilma's 18th birthday, she went for a walk and wasn't heard from again until the summer of 1973 when she married Donald Wellington. During her marriage to Donald, she was arrested twice in two years for prostitution. There is an odd overlap in the information pertaining to her children. Most accounts only have her married to Wellington and Irvin. It has her giving birth to Donald Wellington Jr. in 1974. Four months later, it has her married to Michael Pizarro Sr., giving birth to a son named Michael Pizarro Jr. It is possible that both men and children exist, and the year of birth is incorrect for one of the children. What happened to either boy is unknown. There is currently a $10,000 reward for information leading to the arrest and conviction of anyone responsible for Wilma's murder. Police currently have a total of eight suspects, with only two being free of previous criminal records. If you have any information about Peaches or the woman in the photograph or about William June Neeson, Berkeley would like you to call his office at 712-472-8300. Hope you enjoyed today's story. If you haven't hit the subscribe button yet, please do so. Take care of yourself and each other.